<laughs> hey everybody, welcome back to another edition of the Garage Learning From Home. I'm Steve Geralt, and today we're going to be talking about how to shoot slow motion, and specifically with the Phantom Camera. So why do you want to shoot slow motion? How does a camera shoot slow motion? What do I need to do for lighting when you shoot slow motion? There's all the questions and I'm going to go over all of these things today in detail as much as I can so that you might be a little more comfortable and a little smarter when you try to shoot slow motion yourself. So before we get into slow motion, let's talk a little bit about how normal cameras work. So normal cameras in the US at least shoot 24 frames per second. That means every second they're going doo -doo 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 -doo, and they're shooting 24 frames. Back in the day with film, that means that actually four, 24 little frames of film were exposed in that second. So to me, that seems pretty easy to understand, but now let's talk a little bit about exposure. Traditional film cameras shoot 180 degree shutter. What does that mean? That means the shutters used to be these round circles that were going round and round and half was filled and half was empty. So round and round it went and half of the time the, the film was getting exposure, the other half it was black. So that same 100 degree shutter angle still holds true today for most film cameras and cinematographers around the world because we got really used to what that looks like. It's considered a very cinematic look the amount of motion blur you get when you're shooting 24 frames at 180 degree shutter. So what does that mean as far as exposure? That means that your shutter speed is 1 48th of a second. So when you think about 1 48th of a second, that's not really that slow. So if I'm moving like this, you might get some crazy motion blur in that and that's gonna be what you get and that's what is normal. Otherwise it would be feel like really choppy. So why am I talking about shutter speed with you? Well, because that all changes when you start going at higher frame rates to shoot slow motion. So basically, how do you shoot slow motion? Well, basically you have to do what's called over crank your camera or shoot at high speed. So you're saying high speed is slow motion? Yes, basically they're interchangeable terms and it's because to go slow motion, you need to shoot at a higher frame rate. So let's take a look at what this looks like. When you shoot 24 frames per second and play back at 24 frames per second, that's just normal real-time speed, what you would see it with your eyeball. But if, let's say now we shoot 48 frames per second, but we still play that back at 24 frames per second, now you're seeing it at half the speed it really happened because you're spacing out those frames over more time. Now to take it to an extreme, let's see we're shooting at 240 frames per second. Now that's 10 times the frames as you were before, so you're actually shooting 10 times slow motion. So that means those 240 frames, when you play them back at 24 frames per second, will play back for 10 seconds in what you captured in one second. So on this Phantom right here, when we shoot as high as let's say 960 frames per second, that is 40 times slow motion. So an action that took one second real time will play back for 40 seconds, which is kind of crazy. So this sounds like so much fun. Why not shoot slow motion for everything? Well, it comes with its drawbacks and let me talk through them right now. So the first drawback to shooting slow motion or high speed is the amount of data you need to capture in this short period of time. That's why the Phantom camera is untouched in so many ways in the world of slow motion, because the way they capture data quickly and save it is unlike any other camera you could find. So let me throw out to you a hypothetical so you could understand. So imagine your 24 frame per second regular camera. Let's imagine that every frame you shoot is one megabyte of data. So that means that every second you're doing 24 frames, which means you're doing 24 megabytes of data. Writing that onto a compact flash card or an SD card or onto a computer live or whatever you want to do isn't that hard because the transfer rate of 24 megabytes per second isn't anything crazy. So now let's take that to the extreme. So now imagine this phantom camera shooting at a thousand frames per second, still at one megabyte per frame. Now you're talking about 1000 megabytes per second of data that you're capturing. And that is a lot of data to try to move onto a hard drive or complex flash card or RAID system. So that's where things get really, really complicated above, let's say about 240 frames per second. So that was a hypothetical, but in reality, the Phantom VO 4K PL, which is the camera that we use, actually captures 12 gigabytes of data per second when you're shooting at 960 frames per second. Think about that, 12 gigs per second. 
That is insane. There's no real drives that could actually move that fast unless it was like some crazy rate array. So that's the reason why these cameras are ex as expensive as they are because of the way they, they deal with this data. So let's talk about the next challenge, which is lighting and exposing a camera shooting at this frame rate. So remember that conversation we had about frame rate earlier where a normal 24 frame per second camera shoots at 1 48th of a second shutter speed. That's actually not so bad. That You don't need a lot of crazy light to expose that unless you're stopped down to like F11 or F16 or something like that. So let's talk for a second specifically about what that looks like when you're getting into higher frame rates. So let's do some math together. At 24 frames per second, you're at 1 48th of a second shutter speed. At 240 frames per second, you're now gonna be at 1 480th of a second shutter speed. Now let's talk about 1,000 frames per second. Now you're gonna be at 1 2,000th of a second shutter speed on your camera. That's really different than 1 48th of a second. So let's imagine a scenario where you're shooting a scene at 24 frames per second, f5.6 at ISO 800. So here your shutter speed is 1 48th of a second at 180 degree shutter angle. Now, Let's look at that same scenario and how much light you would need if you were gonna shoot that at 800 frames per second. Basically, it would be the same as needing enough light to shoot F64 at your normal 24 frames frame rate compared to 5.6. So that's five more stops of light than you had before just to shoot the same F-stop at a higher frame rate. Now imagine you need F11 at 1000 frames per second. Think about how much light that becomes. So the challenge here is for every f-stop of light you need, you need to double the wattage of the lights you're using. Let's pretend you're using a 100 watt light bulb to shoot your normal scene. To shoot the same scene at 800 frames per second, you would need a 3,200 watt light bulb. That's a lot of power. This is part of the reason why shooting super slow motion is out of reach for so many people, because it's not just that you need this new camera, but you need these lights to go with it, and you need probably a bigger generator or a bigger studio that has more power, because suddenly your everything kind of gets exponentially more. So now we've discussed all the data that the camera produces, we discussed the amount of light you need, and now we gotta discuss the kind of light you need. Because for anybody that shot slow motion on their phone knows that suddenly lights start going strobing or what's called flicker in your shots. This might be a great opportunity to check out the LED video we put up on the YouTube a little while back because it's really going to break down for you PWM and power supplies and one of the, some of the reasons that cause flicker, especially in LED lights. So what causes flicker? Well, basically in the US, our power supply is AC and runs at 60 hertz. That means 60 flashes every second. To the naked eye, that looks like a light source might be continuous. But when you go and start shooting slow motion, slower than 60 frames per second, you might start capturing some strobing effect happening. And then imagine when you get up to as high as capturing 1000 frames per second, how you're gonna see strobe happening all over the place because even high quality LEDs will still flicker at those frame rates. My experience with most HMI lights is that there's still some sort of flicker in there when you're shooting at the higher frame rates, let's say above 600 frames. The challenge with most lower priced LEDs is they all flicker like crazy. Even some of the really high end ones will flicker at the higher frame rates around 800 and 1000 frames. So you gotta be really cautious when choosing the lights that you're gonna use on a phantom shoot. This is a big reason why so many people still use these huge movie lights when they're shooting slow motion because they don't flicker, but they're also super inefficient. You need to be using these 10,000 or 20,000 watt lights and even multiples of them if you need to be shooting at like F8 at 1,000 frames per second. So that's really painful, especially for us shooting food where everything on set just starts to melt. All the food, the chocolate, the ice cream, it's really challenging. And the, one of the biggest reasons why we build our own LED lights and we control the power supplies to make sure that they don't flicker. So to summarize, here are the reason why shooting slow motion, especially with a Phantom, are so painful. A, you produce crazy amounts of data. B, you need crazy amounts of light. And C, you need high quality flicker free light so that you don't get strobing effects in your slow motion. So now let's talk a little more specifically about the Phantom VO 4K that we use in the studio on most of our shoots. Phantom cameras today are made by a company called Visit Research based in New Jersey. The company was originally founded in the 1950s as a photographic analysis company specializing in high-speed photographics research using film. 
In the 90s, they shifted focus and started working on high-speed electronic sensors as they wouldn't need film anymore. This is when they became Vision Research and the beginnings of the Phantom Camera line. For the most part, Vision Research is a science company. They make cameras for high-end laboratories, crash tests, ballistics, fluid dynamics, educational departments, you name it, universities. They all use Phantom Cameras for very scientific purposes to study what happens at really high speeds. They have a wide range of cameras with different frame rates and abilities depending on exactly what you're trying to capture. So they eventually moved out of being just a science company and made some film cameras for cinematographers like myself. They even won an Academy Award in 2012. So one of the big changing moments in history was when they released the Phantom Flex 4K in 2013. It was a 4K camera that could do a thousand frames per second with a beautiful sensor made for cinematographers shooting films. On top of that, this new camera was way easier to use. It actually had controls right on the side. You didn't need to be tethered to a computer if you didn't want to. Had super high speed onboard storage called Cinemags. It was an amazing achievement in camera technology and people are still using it like crazy today all over the world as it set such a high bar back in 2013 that it's still relevant now in 2020. We ourselves sometimes rent the Flex 4K when we need a second camera on set. I want to break down the Phantom workflow for you a little bit so you can better understand how it works and what the limitations are. Today I'm speaking specifically about our VO 4K, not about all Phantom cameras as they're all slightly different. Let's talk a little bit about how everyday cameras work compared to the Phantom. So everyday DSLRs or high-end REDs or ARRI cameras all have a mag on them that you record the data to as you're shooting. You hit record, you go Woo, shoot whatever you're shooting, you hit stop and it stops recording. That's not the case with the Phantom at all. The big difference with the Phantom is it's saving the data to an onboard RAM drive that's super duper duper fast as you're shooting. So the VO 4K has a 72 gigabyte RAM buffer on it. This means you can record 72 gigabytes before you're out of space. The challenge is at the rate that you're recording data on the VO, you could be out of space in a matter of seconds. Unlike normal cameras where you might be able to record for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, even an hour straight because I have a really big card on it. This camera, let's say you're shooting 960 frames per second, could only shoot five and a half seconds of real time before the buffer is full. Yeah, you heard me. It shoots 72 gigabytes of data in under six seconds, which is crazy. So let me talk you through the workflow of doing a shot at 936 frames per second in full open gate 4K on this camera. So you have two options. You could trigger your camera to start recording at the beginning of your shot, or you trigger to tell the camera to stop recording at the end of a shot. This is usually called either front trigger or rear trigger. So if I'm more interested in making sure I capture the end of an action, I always do end trigger. If I wanted to cap make sure I capture the beginning of an action, I usually do front trigger. So let's talk about this hypothetical pour shot I'm doing, right? So I'm gonna go like this and I'm gonna pour liquid into a glass like right here. So let's say that pour is gonna take about three seconds of real time to happen. I wanna make sure I get the beginning all the way to the end of it. So I'm gonna trigger it right before I start pouring because I have a total of about six seconds to record this shot before the RAM overwrites itself. So I go, ready, trigger. One, two, three, pour. Ugh. All right, now I have 72 gigs of data of this pour shot, but I might not need all 72 gigs of data. So the next step in the Phantom workflow is actually, just like in video editing, trimming your ins and outs of the footage you actually wanna save off the RAM onto an external drive. So let's say in this hypothetical shot, I love the middle two seconds of it the most, but I wanna give myself a little flexibility. So I might give myself three seconds of the real data, which is about half the buffer. So this is gonna be about a, I don't know, 35, 40 gigabyte file. So I trim that using the software on the computer or on the back of the camera, and then I need to save it off to an external drive. The speed of this drive makes a big difference in how long it takes to save this clip. For let's say about a 35 gig file, it might take about a minute. For a full buffer, it takes a little bit over two minutes to transfer all 72 gigs over 10 gig ethernet to our computer. I wanna talk you through the frame rate distribution on this camera a little more so you might understand it a little better. 
So basically, that 72 gig RAM built into the camera can fit a total of 5,283 frames at full resolution 4096 by 2304. So at 800 frames per second, you could shoot 6.6 .6 seconds. At 240 frames per second, you could shoot for 22 seconds. And about three and a half minutes, you could shoot at 24 frames per second. So is this the right camera to shoot actors doing long scenes? Absolutely not. It would be the worst camera could you ever use for that. This camera can only shoot three and a half minutes before you have to stop, save for two minutes, and then start it recording again. That workflow doesn't really work very well for a lot of regular shoots, but it works just fine for slow motion shoots, especially shoots that we do usually have five to 10 minute resets between takes. So we have plenty of time to save off the data and get the camera rolling again, reset and go again. So if I'm gonna be doing a longer take, sometimes I actually need to go down to 2K resolution because that'll give me four times the amount of time that I can record before I need to stop and save the buffer. So the really cool thing about this camera is if I wanna shoot even more slow motion, I can, I just have to give up some resolution. So at 2K resolution, I could get about 2000 frames per second. If I go down to 720p, I could get 3000 frames per second. And if I go to 480, it's even more than that. I don't know. I mean, that's pretty cool, but you might not want to use that for really high-end work. There's actually better cameras by Phantom equipped for shooting at higher frame rates. Let's say I needed 15,000 frames per second or 25,000 frames per second or 100,000 frames per second. You have to realize that one frame rate isn't right for all slow motion. Certain things like bullets, you need to shoot a way higher frame rate if you really want to see what's going on because they're moving so fast. So... Now I'm gonna show you a little bit of a comparison of different frame rates so you can see for yourself, A, how much light back here we need as the frame rates climb, and also what you can see in the action itself as things start falling and bouncing and how different frame rates show the different actions. So all I'm gonna be doing is throwing this stack of washers right here down onto the metal surface back here and capturing it on the Phantom at different frame rates. And I'll show you what that looks like. So I'll be adjusting my dimmable LED light here up as we need more light for the frame rates so you could see how blinding it's gonna be. It's gonna be so blinding. 24 frames per second. So now 48 frames per second. So now let's take a look at 120 frames per second. You can see that already this light back here is getting much brighter. So now 240 frames per second. It's getting bright. So now 480 frames per second. Ah. Now, 938.8 frames per second. Woo! So now we're at 1978 frames per second, but I had to go down into 2K resolution, which crops the sensor. So you see that this one we're punching a little bit more than the other shots. Woo, it is bright. So just for fun, I'm gonna do another one where I sense a crop again at 720p to see what it looks like at almost 3,000 frames per second. Almost 3,000 frames per second. It is so blindingly bright back here, it's crazy. And this is only to shoot at f2.8. Here we go. Thank you so much for supporting us in this crazy time. We appreciate you and we love you guys. So thanks so much for joining us and being part of this journey with us. I'm gonna be so blind.